Hello, everyone. Welcome. All right. Oh. We are so excited to have you back. We have been on a little bit of a break, but we are back for today's program, All the Best Birds of Maine. And I'm so excited because here with us today is Nick Lund. Nick is a longtime friend of MCV. He is also the advocacy and outreach manager at Maine Audubon, and he is also the author of the newly released ABA Field Guide to the Birds of Maine. He's going to take us on a whirlwind tour of Maine's diverse and dazzling avafauna today. That is a fabulous word that is new to me today. Thank you already, Nick. I'm learning things. Uh, and, and we're going to get into it. So first, my name is Kathleen Neal. I am the Director of Policy and Partnerships here at Maine Conservation Voters and Maine Conservation Alliance. Our organizations represent more than 13,000 members and supporters dedicated to protecting Maine's environment and our democracy. MCA does that through education, collaboration, and advocacy, and MCV by influencing public policy, holding politicians accountable, and winning elections few technical notes before we turn it over to Nick. You're going to hear from Nick first. We'll save questions for the Q&A session at the end. You don't have to wait, though. You can send those questions to me whenever they occur to you. You can chat and find me in the chat, um, and I'll keep track of those questions. We ask that you not chat Nick directly. We want him to be able to concentrate on his, uh, his presentation and not be fielding comments in the middle. If you do have any technical challenges today, you can message Chess Gundrum and she will help you out. We are recording this event and you will get an email later this afternoon with a link to the recording. And I'm gonna let you know right now, also a link to purchase your very own copy of hey. Nick's new book. All right, let's get into it, Nick. I am going to turn it over to you and thanks everybody for being with us today. All right. Hey, everybody. Thank you so much, Kathleen. Thank you, MCV. What an amazing organization. Let me, I love MCV so much. Uh, great folks. They do great work. Um, uh, please become a member if you're not a member right now. Also, I work for Maine Audubon, another great organization. Please become a member if you're not right now. Two great organizations doing great stuff for Maine. But today I come at you not with my main Audubon hat on, but with my own hat on. I'm not wearing a hat with my hair on. Um, and I come as you as a birder, as a, a author, as Kathleen mentioned, to talk about Maine. Um, I hope everybody can see this here. And um, this is what we're doing. Look, as my own author person, I get my own headshots. Look at that. Uh, we went down to the beach there, which was, you know, their choice. Um, but I recently released, as Kathleen mentioned, uh, the American Birding Association Field Guide to the Birds of Maine. Um, I am a writer in my uh, spare time. Uh, this book came out a couple months ago. It's great. It's a great introduction, uh, thorough introduction for sort of beginner and intermediate birders to all the birds we have in Maine. And we got some good ones. Um, I'm also uh, a, a writer for other things, I released another book last month, a middle grade science book for, uh, for teenagers, early teenagers called The Ultimate Biography of Earth from Workman Publishing. This is the illustrated history of the entire universe, uh, Earth, the Earth part of the universe mostly um, from the Big Bang till right now. It's really, really cool. Great illustrations from this gentleman, Jason Ford. Um, I write online as the birdist. Uh, that's my little uh, bird logo in the middle there. And then I also do other stuff. I'm the founder of uh, something called Google Street View Birding, which uh, is just a group of insane people who in their spare time um, troll around Google Street View and see if they can identify birds in the background. Um, pretty crazy. We have over 5,000 members of the group and we found Believe it or not, over 1,100 individual species of birds um, captured on these cameras. Um, it's, uh, it's pretty wild. But what I love to do most is talk about birds. Um, uh, I love Maine. I'm here, from here in Maine. Uh, and I love birding. And I love birding here in Maine. We have some great 
birds. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. Starting with this map of Maine, of course. When I think about the birds in Maine, I think about it in basically three sections. Um, we, you know, we are lucky in Maine to have a whole lot of beautiful environment um, and that groups like Maine Audubon and groups like MCB have worked so hard to conserve. And uh, when I think about the bird life here, I basically think about it in three ways. I think of the coast, right? Maine is famous for our Gulf of Maine and all of our offshore islands here. Um, these uh, are, are perfect areas for um, lots of seabirds, lots of gulls. Uh, and then birds come to uh, breed there in the summertime out on these offshore islands. So the coast, um, which also includes uh, beautiful beaches and marshes on the coast, uh, is one sort of great bird area. Then we have uh, what I call, you know, some, some temperate forest, deciduous eastern forest. Um, a lot of southern Maine is this forest and then sort of spots up, up north uh, where we have um, a lot of uh, eastern birds. For a lot of birds, Maine is sort of represents the northernmost extent of their range. Um, and then the third part is sort of getting up further north. We have the southern edge of the boreal forest. The boreal so forest, sort of the, the, the section in between the temperate forest and the tundra up north. And there's a whole suite of birds that exist in that forest that don't exist anywhere further south, um, at least on the east coast. And um, those birds are really wonderful and sought after. So Maine, we're, we're lucky to have so much conserved land and so many birds there. So how am I going to get through it? This is called All the Best Birds of Maine. And how am I going to even break it up like that? I'm going to do some top five lists. Um, and I, to help illustrate this, I made this sort of nightmare image. Um, you know, I grew up watching David Letterman do top 10 lists. Um, I went to some face combiner website and combined a picture of me and David Letterman, and that's what came up with it. Um, it looks terrible, um, but uh, that's sort of the mood we're in right now. So we're gonna do some main bird top five lists um, to get going. All right, let's, st let's start here. The most commonly seen birds in Maine. So what I did was I went on uh, a website called eBird. eBird is the website that all kinds of birders use to input their sightings. So you see a bird, you you log it in eBird and it goes to this big database, which not only tracks the sightings that you've had personally, but is this awesome scientific database that can show how bird populations are going. There's all kinds of ways to use the information and, and see it. And I scanned through to see the, which birds were reported the most, right? So we're going to start here, this guy. Uh, when I do this in person, I like to sort of question people. And I know that some of you out there, I see Michael Catania online. I know he knows this bird. Um, this is one of the most common birds seen in Maine. This is a this is of our sparrows. There are what ten or so sparrows in Maine. They're all this sort of um, uh, variation on a brown uh, skulking bird. Um, uh, they're hard to identify, but sometimes they give you a bunch of clues. This is the most common sparrow I'd say in Maine. This is a bird called a song sparrow. This is a bird that right now, if you look out your window or listen out your window, um, you'll probably hear this beautiful song sparrow singing outside. Um, they are, they love to hang out uh, in uh, bushes and low shrub type areas. Um, they can be seen in suburban areas, but also out uh, in, the, in the woods, so, so they're really common. Um, but they sort of are, can be confused with a lot of other sparrows we have in Maine, because that's the way sparrows work. Um, so one thing to keep in mind here, just as an ID tip is, Get this little line coming down off the bill there, the sub mustachial stripe, a little below the mustache. But also, you can see uh, all these streaks on the breast here. Um, song sparrows are known to have this coarse streaking that meets in the central spot right there. And of course, famous for their song, right? Um, they uh, sing a lot, they sing all day long, and their song starts with a couple slow notes before going to this tumble of songs. So it'll be like, so it starts slow and goes fast. That's one of our most common birds. All right, we couldn't get there, couldn't get there without getting into some gulls. This, of course, is a gull. Um, it's one of the three most common gulls that we have in the state of Maine, and I'll just lay them out. So um, I'm not super picky about whether you say the word seagull or not. Say seagull if you want but technically it's just gulls. And we have three common ones in Maine. Here's where they look. And this is educational right now, because if you go out 
uh, you'll be the one who knows how to tell the difference between the gulls. Um, our number four bird is the middle one, but we'll do the ones on the edges first. Um, the, the leftmost bird, um, and I should say that overall birders are not the most creative folks when it comes to naming birds. And so that one on the left, that, that gull that has the black ring around its bill, that is a ring-billed gull. There you go. Um, it's the smallest of the three. It's the one you most likely find inland and the one you most likely find in like parking lots or around dumpsters. I know if I was here in Falmouth and I went to the Walmart, um, I would definitely see a bunch of ring-billed gulls loafing around. The furthest to the right bird, that the dark-mantled gull, is the great black-backed gull. It's actually the largest gull in the world. Um, and it's seen very commonly here in Maine, but really only on the coast. This is one that you very rarely sort of find away from like uh, sitting on the pier at the ocean or on the beach. This is a bird very much found um, on the water. It, fairly easy to identify. It's, it's the largest one. It's got that dark gray feathering on its back, the great black-backed gull. In the middle is our number four bird, not helpfully named, not named after what it looks like, but rather what it eats. This is the herring gull. Herring gull is common uh, right on the water, uh, but also inland too. You will see them over cities and, and towns and sometimes over lakes, depending on where you are. Um, it's uh, intermediate size between the three. Um, it's uh, a little bit uh, intermediate gray color on the back too. Um, and, and doesn't have any ring around its bill. They can be difficult to identify, um, but uh, once you get the hang of the other two, then it becomes more helpful. The third most commonly reported bird in Maine, this is a stunner, American goldfinch, a beauty, a beauty. Um, very common all over the state. Um, one of the, at Maine Audubon, we get questions all the time about whether they migrate or not. Um, they don't, they may have some movements around, but they generally don't migrate very far. They're seed eating birds, and so they can withstand a cold winter as long as there are seeds around. But one thing they do do is they change their plumage pretty drastically. Um, in the summer, we have, the, at least the, the males have this very bright yellow plumage with the little black cap and the black wings. Um, that's their sort of, uh, their, their tuxedo to show off for the ladies that they wear all, all summer long. They really want to impress folks. When the breeding season is over, they're like, ah, this tuxedo itches, I don't need to wear this anymore. I'm gonna get in some sweatpants. And so a lot of goldfinches, uh, uh, goldfinches um, molt their plumage and wear, and instead have this very brownish, greenish plumage that they wear all uh, winter. They don't need to impress anybody because the breeding season is over. They look very different, but they're the same birds. And you very likely have the same goldfinches at your feeders year round. They just look very different. Um, Goldfinches are very common, but they can be hard to see. They, they fly around a lot and they're small. So one way to remember them that they're around or to listen for them is to listen for their call. They are one of the birds that sings constantly while they're flying. Um, and so if you can learn to recognize their, their flight note, their flight song, you, could, uh, you can identify them a lot more commonly. Um, and the trick to remembering it is it kinda, and I'm gonna say kinda, this is something that birders do a lot, there's so many calls out there and we're always trying to figure out how to remember them. But the flight song of the goldfinch sounds like they're saying potato chip, okay? So it goes, they're flying, they go potato chip, potato chip, potato chip, like that. It has that uh, cadence of the word potato chip. And so if you're walking around and you hear somebody flying and it sounds like they're saying potato chip, that is a goldfinch. And don't forget that you heard it from me. All right, we got two left. Two commonly bird, seen birds left. Oh man, the best. Black-capped chickadee, the second most commonly reported bird in Maine, our state bird, um, a beautiful bird. I love chickadee so much. Again, a bird that is here year round, um, a bird that uh, is very social. They're constantly moving around in little flocks or in their territory. Um, a, a beloved bird, a, another one that is found from your backyard to the deep woods. Um, they know their territory so well um, that uh, one good idea when you hear some chickadees is uh, look through the whole flock because other birds will often follow chickadee flocks around um, because they're the sort of locals. Um, and so you may encounter other species when you're with chickadees. Um, chickadees, uh, one cool thing about chickadees is one of the ways that they, they survive in the winter is that they cache some food. So they will take 
especially in the fall, starting in the fall, they will take seeds and not eat them. They'll hide them. They'll stick them under bark and in little crevices places. That way in the winter, they can return to those crevices and pluck out a little morsel. And their brains actually expand by about 30% to remember where they stuck all these things. And so scientists are studying chickadees and titmice to understand if we can like how their brain works and can we improve all the, the function of our brains uh, based on how they work. Um, just a wonderful species all around and I'm proud to have them as our state bird. The number one bird, any guesses? What have we missed? What have we missed? Dong, the crow, the American crow, a classic, a beloved bird, extremely intelligent, um, uh, here year round, omnivorous, smart. Um, one of actually three corvid species, all black uh, birds that we have in Maine. The other two, this is the American crow, the most common one we have all around. They do that very common like caw, C-A-W, caw, call. Um, another bird that we have in the summertime is called the fish crow. This is a bird of southern Maine mostly, and it's still uh, not very numerous around. They look I, nearly identical to American crows, very hard to tell apart just by seeing them, maybe a little bit smaller and maybe a little bit glossier. Um, they have a very nasal call. Most of the way people identify them is through hearing them. They go, uh-uh, uh-uh, uh-uh. It's, like it's like a kid saying no to broccoli. Uh-uh, uh-uh. That's what fish crows sound like. The other bird is, is a bigger one, the uh, common raven. Um, beautiful, big, soaring bird of mostly northern, uh, you know, more commonly seen or heard in northern Maine, I'd say, but they are still common in southern Maine as well. And they croak, ah, 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 and do other kinds of sounds like that. Very smart, cool birds. Um, larger than American crows and with a um, larger sort of diamond-shaped tail. Um, those are our three. All right, next top five, summer tourists. So these are birds that are only in Maine in the summertime and they are not here in the wintertime. The way it works, right? Uh, Maine is very seasonal. As you know, we are in the thick of a delightful summer right now. Uh, for birds, this is a great place to be to raise your young. There are tons of insects around. Insects are by far the most important food source for baby birds, especially caterpillars. This is why you should plant native plants because they produce the most caterpillars. Um, so uh, in, but in the wintertime, there's no caterpillars. Well, they're not, not plentiful. Um, there are very few insects. And so a lot of these birds that rely on insects to feed their young need to get the heck out of here. So that's why we have these, these huge migration, right? Um, you know, we have billions of birds flying north in the spring to get here for the breeding season. They do what they need to do. They, they fledge their chicks and they get the heck out of here before it gets too cold. So we have a lot of birds that are only here in the summer. Some of the most famous are the warblers. Um, this is a drawing that I just stole from the internet and I want to put it in the chat in case you want to buy a print um, because I want to acknowledge the fact that I just took it. Um, um, warblers. So not all of these birds live in Maine, but Maine is uh, and the East Coast is famous for warblers. It's really the most sort of famous um, migration and breeding birds that we have. Warblers are these small insect eating birds um, that in the spring, we have about 25 species here in Maine. Each of them puts on their, has their own colorful plumage. They all have a uniform of uh, bright, differently colored plumages and songs. And in the spring, especially when they all migrate through, it's just a, a birder's bonanza because at certain hotspots, you can see all these different colorful species and hear them um, all summer. This, this is um, one of the most famous groups of birds in the whole East Coast and, and why a lot of birders come to Maine and, and, uh, and look for birds. Um, many of these birds uh, breed here in Southern Maine. I'm in Cumberland right now. Many of these species uh, breed in Southern Maine. A lot of them go up to Northern Maine or the Boreal Canada to breed up there. Each of them has their own sort of niches and, and ecological needs, um, but they're all beautiful and colorful and, um, and are, are welcome in the summertime. Um, terns are another group. Um, so terns are uh, thin, slight seabirds. I love terns a lot. Um, they are uh, sort of, you know, faster and more nimble than gulls. Um, they squawk a lot. 
Um, in Maine, we have several different species. Represented here on the left is a common tern, uh, which breeds uh, commonly on a lot of Maine's offshore islands. Um, on the right, we have that yellow-billed bird. That's a least tern. Um, that is the smallest uh, of, the, of the terns that we have in Maine. Um, and a protected species here. Maine Audubon does a lot of incredible work to protect least tern colonies where they are. On, they are mostly beach nesting birds. Um, and so if you go down to especially places like Scarborough Marsh um, or, um, or Popham Beach or uh, beaches in southern Maine, you can see these um, cute little guys diving around. Uh, we also have other species, Arctic terns, roseate terns, and endangered species that uh, nest in small numbers off the coast. Um, I, when I think of summer, I think of terns. Um, I'm a bird nerd, and so that's maybe unique to me, but um, terns sort of epitomize the summer for me. Um, um, I love them. Another one, sort of some under the radar summer tourists, uh, vireos. Vireos don't get the press that warblers get, um, but they are a cool little suite of birds. We probably have one, two, three, four, five, six, six or so different vireo species here in Maine. This is the blue-headed vireo. Um, again, uh, insect-eating songbirds, they have a little hooked bill there um, with uh, their own um, unique uh, plumage uniform that they wear in the summertime. Um, this beautiful one, uh, the blue-headed, um, has that blue head and those sort of white spectacles there. Um, um, uh, Philadelphia vireo is, is all yellow. The yellow-throated is yellow-throated, as you can imagine. Um, famous mostly for their songs, I would say. Um, vireos, for the most part, um, sing, uh, well, several species of vireos sing these, uh, sing a lot. They sing all day, especially the red-eyed vireo, which you can, again, probably hear at your window right now if you've got any trees nearby. But they sing these sort of uh, three-noted songs a red eye does and the, in, incessantly all day. Here I am, curio. Um, this blue-headed vireo does the same thing except mostly two notes and a little slower. Um, once you learn to recognize them, you'll hear them around a lot. I love summer vireos. And of course we have raptors who come up. Um, not all raptors are migratory in Maine. We have a lot of, uh, of hawks and things throughout the winter. Uh, anyone who's driven on 295 or 95 in the wintertime knows that that's where you see lots of red-tailed hawks coming around. Um, but one hawk we only have in the summertime is this guy. This is a, called a broad-winged hawk. Um, they come up in the thousands uh, from Central America and breed throughout uh, the uh, you know, Northern North America. Um, they are smaller than most of the other hawks. They're, they're in the same family as the red-tailed hawk, Budio hawks, um, but they're smaller than red-tailed hawks. They have that sort of striped banded tail there. And when you see them from below, you see what, you, what, what I notice frequently is sort of their wings are outlined in black here. So they have very sort of light colored wings underneath and then this outline in black. Some people also say that their wings look like a candle flame. They sort of have that sort of um, shapeliness of a candle flame, but um, what I see is the sort of outline here in the tail. Um, beautiful birds, they nest right in the forests, um, and they give this beautiful sort of two, like very mournful two-noted call. Ooh, ooh. Terrible, that was terrible, um, but um, this very simple two-noted call that I love, um, um, Broadwing talks. So I'm watching the time here, so I'm going to keep going. Summer, Taurus, the last one, um, some wading birds. This is a glossy ibis. What a cool bird this is. Um, in Maine, again, um, one of the difficulties in the winter is that things freeze solid. And so if you're a bird that likes to dig in the mud or uh, walk in shallow water, it's a little difficult in the winter because it's frozen solid. So in the summertime, when things thaw out, a lot of birds come up to um, hang out in our marshes and breed and, and uh, enjoy the marshlands. This is just one of them here, this beautiful glossy ibis. Um, one of the most common places to see them is at Scarborough Marsh down in Scarborough, where you can see a good sized flocks of them. Um, but uh, West Keg and, and um, some other marshes around the state uh, are good for them. Um, but lots of other wading birds you can find, uh, uh, snowy egrets, great egrets, um, rails like Virginia rail, Sora, um, a lot of birds like that, which are, can be more difficult to see because they like to hide in the grass, uh, but are summer vi visitors that we love.
The flip side of summer visitors are the winter warriors. Uh, you know, Maine is not an easy place to be in the winter, but there are some birds that are only here in the wintertime. Um, this is like their, their vacation spot. Um, one of them is this bird here. Um, you know, we, Maine is famous for our breeding loons. Um, we have common loons breeding here um, and also wintering here. Um, but we also have another species that is only here in the winter. This is called the red-throated loon. Um, on the right, you can see why it's called the red-throated loon. That is a plumage that you only very rarely see in Maine. That's it, the bird's breeding plumage. Very often, what you mostly see is on the left there, it's, it's non-breeding plumage. Um, they, uh, um, so loons, all species of loons, breed on fresh water. Um, that's great, but if you live in Maine or anywhere north of us, uh, you can't live on fresh water in the winter because it freezes solid, right? So you gotta get out of there. You gotta find a place with open water. So that's what loons do. Common loons, red throated loons, all the loons. Um, they bail out in the, uh, when the winter comes before the ice, <clears throat> before their, their breeding ponds freeze and they find open water. And for a lot of them, that means the ocean. Uh, and so common loons, the ones that you're seeing at your camps and lakes right now, they're all coming, most of them right to Maine, uh, in the Gulf of Maine to enjoy the, the open water. But also some loons that breed farther north, like these red-throated loons, they come all the way down and hang out in the, uh, in the Gulf of Maine. They are... Um, smaller and thinner than common loons. Um, these red-throated loons, they sort of, they hold their bill at a bit of a snotty posture, you could say. They're a little aloof looking um, and they're whiter on the neck. And so that's a way that you can tell if you've got a red-throated loon. Um, you, they're visible from any sort of um, coastline if you can see them. Sometimes it, they're, they're not super close to shore, uh, but places like, um, like Pine Point uh, in Scarborough or Pemaquid, any sort of coastal spot in the winter, if you can tolerate being out there, is a good spot for them. Uh, some other birds, you know, I'm going to keep talking about gulls. I'm learning about gulls. We have a couple other gulls that are only here in the wintertime. Um, they, unlike the others, are kind of easier to identify because there's one key difference between um, these two species. This is the one species, um, a young bird and an adult bird. Um, Unlike the ones that we have year round, they don't have any black on their wingtips here. So this species is called an Iceland gull. They breed, like their name, up in Iceland and parts, parts closer to the Arctic Circle. And unlike our resident birds, they don't have any black. Iceland gulls may have a little bit of dark gray or sometimes even darker down here, but they are but looking for these white wings, white wingtips, um, help separate them from our uh, our local birds. Same thing with this youngster here. And you can see that this sort of light color extends all the way down through. These are birds that, are, that um, come down in the winter in smaller numbers, um, but they are around. One of the great, uh, and I'll actually, I'll, before I talk about where, this is the other species, it's called the Glacius gull. Um, so the Iceland gull here is a little bigger than a ring-billed gull, so it's fairly small. It has a bit of this sort of dove-like rounded head here. Uh, Glacius gulls are bigger. They're like bigger than herring gulls or about herring gull size. And they look a lot like herring gulls, except you see, I mean, this bird all white right here. And it's got this bicolored bill. And this adult bird, no black in the wing tips right there. That's an easy way to separate them if you can see them in the winter. Um, they'll come down and they'll congregate wherever gulls congregate. Um, one of the best places to see gulls is like our wharves and places that there may be food for them. So um, a lot of places that are uh, one common place to in the winter to see these two gulls is in Portland Harbor. You go down there and these birds may be kicking around. Just look for the ones with white in their wings, winter only. Um, just like the loons, there are other um, sea ducks um, that come down to spend their winters in Maine that are not that when their breeding areas up in the tundra freeze solid in the winter, they got to find some open water. So they come down. This is, I think, my favorite of the winter ducks. This is called a long-tailed duck, aptly named. Perhaps you could even think of a, a better name to describe this beautiful bird. Um, this is the male, um, and they have that bright long tail or that, uh, that long tail there. Very sort of um, unusually patterned, I would say, with the browns and whites, a beautiful bird. They are very vocal. Um, they, their call reminds me of winter birding. So I said that turns remind me of summer. Long-tailed ducks remind me of winter. They do this weird like, ah, 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 ah
um, which again, I'm embarrassed to do that. It's good that I can't see anybody here because I can do whatever I want. It looks like I'm just talking to myself. Um, uh, Long-tailed ducks are beautiful, but we also get scoters and um, lots more eiders that are coming down and harlequin ducks, um, a whole bunch of ducks that are only here in the winter that are, are very cool. And, and similarly, we have some other um, uh, alcids. So alcids, are birds related to puffins. They're seabirds, pelagic seabirds, diving birds that dive down to catch fish. Um, a couple of them are really only found here in the winter. Some of them breed here, like the puffin and the um, common myrrh, um, but birds like this tiny dove key are really only found in the winter. This guy is like, yeah, he's like, he's like fit in your hand. These guys are tiny. Um, I don't know how they survive out there on the water, but they do it. Um, they're fairly hard to see. This is a pretty hard to see bird primarily because they're so small. Um, but if you get out there at a place like Two Lights um, or um, uh, Nubble Light, any sort of like uh, uh, um, uh, uh, Biddeford Pool, I'm not trying to say, yeah, but out in Biddeford Pool, East Point Sanctuary, Maine Audubon's, um, get out in the ocean in the winter if you can tolerate it and look for these tiny little guys flying. They're really hard to see when they're on the water. The best place to see them is when they're flying because they, they're moving. Um, so they are, that's a really sought after bird in the winter and a really cool one. The number five winter warrior, my son's favorite bird, uh, the snowy owl. Um, an incredible bird, again, breeds up on the tundra. So when the tundras get uh, uninhabitable, they look for places to go. Um, uh, they only really only seem in the winter. Some will linger into spring, but um, beautiful birds. They're most often found at places that look, you know, that feel like the tundra. So open beaches, big grasslands, uh, airports are a really big one. Portland Jetport and Brunswick Airport um, uh, are two great places to see snowy owls in the winter. Um, you got to sort of look for them. You, you can't get close to them, um, but they're out there um, hunting and they're just absolute stunners. So five winter warriors. Um, I was looking at some birds the other day and I thought they looked funny. So these are four birds that aren't even found in Maine, but they look like they saw a ghost. Look at these guys. They're, these are called boobooks. They're a type of owls that are found in Asia and Australia. Um, and I was just looking through pictures of them the other day and all the pictures look so funny. <laughs> they're nocturnal, so they have big eyes so they can see lots of stuff. But when you see them in the daytime, they're like, holy moly. Um, not found in Maine at all. Just a little, um, a little pause here. All right. We did five of Maine's most common birds. So now let's go into our rarest birds. Um, sought after and exciting. Um, maybe perhaps not one of the rarest birds, but one of our most iconic and sought after birds and sort of difficult to find. Atlantic puffin, of course. Maine is the only state in the nation with breeding Atlantic puffins. Uh, we are very lucky to have them. Um, and many thanks to the work, lots of uh, folks work from the National Audubon Society who helped reintroduce them um, to uh, federal and state partners who continually work for their protection. Um, Atlantic puffins are beautiful. Look at these guys. Um, uh, again, this is their breeding plumage. This is their summer plumage in the, in the winter when they go off and spend time in the open ocean. Um, they aren't quite as colorful. They're a little sort of dusky. They don't need to show off to mates at that point anymore. Um, and um, beautiful birds, uh, sort of um, not known a lot, like a lot of seabirds, not known for their vocal repertoires. Um, they uh, sound terrible, frankly. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. Um, if you look online and see sort of see descriptions of their call, the way that they're described, their song is called chainsaw snores. So if you hear a puffin, it's like, ah, ah. they make up for it in their beauty. Um, they're wonderful birds. Um, they uh, nest in burrows in certain islands off the coast. Here is uh, a bit of an older map of some places to find them in Maine. Um, you got to work for them. So you got to get on a boat and get out there in the water to, to see puffins. Um, Maine Audubon runs a number of trips. Look on our events page if you want to check it out. Um, totally worth it. It's an experience you can't get in any other state, and they're a fantastic bird. Uh, here's another one. Um, one of Maine's rarest and most sought after birds, a bird I heard but did not did, uh, see this past weekend at the very top of Sugarloaf Mountain. This is a bird called a Bicknell's thrush. 
So thrushes are uh, songbirds, the, basically the size and shape of a robin. A robin is a thrush. And so in Maine, there are, uh, what, five or so species of thrush um, that all sort of have the basic size and shape of a robin. They are sort of pot-bellied birds. Um, unlike the robin, though, most of them are like this. They're, they're brown, uh, varying shades of brown and varying amounts of spots, brown spots on their breast. That could go anywhere from a viri, which is like a sort of orangey brown with, with almost no spots on his breast, to a wood thrush, which is um, sort of a, has big rich spots on its breast and sort of is a rich orangey brown on its back. Um, they live in the woods. They are famous um, for their calls. They have, um, thrushes have these beautiful, especially a hermit thrush and Swainson's thrush, these beautiful flute-like calls, which um, a lot of people uh, really love when they get into the deep woods. Um, they're found across the state uh, in the summer. Um, this Bicknell's thrush is the most sought after. It has um, some of the most restricted range of any birds, breeding range of any birds in the country. They only breed right at just below the tree line of Appalachian Mountains. So for example, I hiked up Sugarloaf all the way up. It was Swainson's thrush calling and hermit thrush calling, but only once I got to, for those of you who know Sugarloaf, up to the top of the skyline spillway chair, did you start getting into these birds. Um, Big Nose thrush nests very close to the top of these mountains. Um, and because they have such um, um, distinct uh, um, needs uh, for their range, they, they don't live uh, in very many places. There aren't a whole lot of, um, uh, you know, above treeline mountains in uh, the Northeast. Um, so here's sort of a, a broad range map for them, but there's really only sort of select mountains within these yellow areas. Uh, in Maine, that includes Saddleback, Katahdin, Sugarloaf, and, and a couple other mountains like that, um, but there aren't a lot of them. So um, this is one of the most sought after birds to get and one of the difficult ones to find because in Maine, um, you got to hike yourself up to these mountains for the most part. Sometimes you can get a driven up Saddleback or lift access, lift access. You can also get them on top of Mount Washington in New Hampshire, which you can drive up to, um, but uh, very cool birds and a sought after one. Um, here we go. Here's a bird um, that is a little tough to see. Uh, let's see if you can see it. Let me try to turn the volume down here. Let me know when you see it. Oh, there it goes. Come up out of the rack. Look at that. Hey. This is a changing of the guard here at the nest of these piping plovers. Um, piping plovers are beautiful shorebirds that have uh, over time evolved to nest right on the beach. Um, nesting on the beach is great um, for them because they are right near their food source. They can pick little arthropods and things right out of the, uh, out of the, out of the sand. Um, they've evolved, as you can tell, to be perfectly camouflaged to nest on the beach. The, the gray on their back perfectly matches the sand colored behind them. The piping, that black striping on their forehead and neck, um, it matches exactly that burnt seaweed, that rack that they like to nest in. Trust me, these birds are extremely well camouflaged. I've walked across beaches and almost had them underfoot because they, um, they do it so well. Um, uh, here's sort of uh, a still picture. You can get, get a look at them. You know, the nesting on the beach is great for piping plovers, but uh, until sort of humans came along, right? Um, humans also love to use beaches. And in Maine, there aren't a ton of sandy beaches to go around. And so as we've you know, sunbathed on them or let our dogs run on them or driven on them or done all kinds of other stuff on the beaches. We've really um, made a mess of piping plover habitat um, such that their numbers were way down in the state, way down. Um, Maine Audubon, where I work, um, uh, and, you know, federal and state partners in the early 80s decided to do something about this. Um, let's not let these birds go away. Let's work to educate uh, folks about the birds on the beaches. Let's work to protect their nests from uh, human predators uh, or human introduced predators like cats and, and pre other predators like um, raccoons and, and, and uh, foxes. Um, and um, guess what? This is what, this is how conservation works. It works. Conservation, when you get into it and do it, the birds will come back. Um, Maine Audubon, um, well, uh, Maine had just 10 pairs of piping plovers in 1981. Um, and this map is, is out of date, but we are uh, way up over a uh, hundred pairs today. 
because of the hard work led by my colleagues at Maine Audubon and with our state and federal partners and local volunteers and municipalities, um, working to identify these nests and, and bring these birds back. And so now uh, on many of the sandy beaches in Southern Maine, um, you can see piping plovers right now running around. I hope you do that. They're still very rare in the scheme of things, um, but, um, but they're coming back thanks to conservation. All right. Um, all right, so this is an illustration. So I, I actually only have two birds left when I talk about this. There are basically two kinds of rare birds. There are birds that there aren't very many of, like piping plovers, but they live here, right? They're, they are native to Maine. Then there are birds that really get my heart a pumping called vagrants. Um, a birder, you know, the cool thing about birds is that they can just up and fly wherever they want. They can go wherever they want. Nothing is stopping a bird except, I don't know, physics and its own muscles and whatever from getting up and flying to a different continent if they want to. It's pretty awesome. And, and that happens a lot in birding. Birds will just show up way out of place. Um, right now, this is a picture taken just a couple of days ago of, I think, I don't know if this is Petit Manan or Seal Island, but see that bird in the middle? That is the black one. That is a different species of puffin that lives uh, in the West Coast. It lives in Alaska, right? This is called a tufted puffin, but is in Maine right now. Uh, you know, one of the, uh, um, resulting factors from, from climate change is that it's, there is less ice uh, on the Northwest Passage. And so it's easier for birds now that traditionally live in the, either the Pacific or the Atlantic to switch oceans to move through. And we're seeing that in the birding world. Um, um, this tufted puffin likely just flew uh, across the Northwest Passage and ended up on the East Coast. And it's like, I, well, these guys kind of look like me. And so right now, as we speak, this individual bird is somewhere uh, in the Gulf of Maine flying around. Maine is famous for vagrant birds, and I, I, we have a couple um, in recent memory. Here is one of them. Um, this is a, an incredible record of a bird. This is a bird called the Great Black Hawk. This is a bird that um, until 2018 had never been seen in the United States before. Um, this is a tropical hawk. They live uh, in tropical areas where there are grasslands. They, they swoop down and catch reptiles a lot, their long legs. Um, in 2018, this guy, uh, Alex Lamoro, who was doing a hawk watch in Texas, saw a great black hawk fly over his head. And he said, holy moly, that's never been seen before in the United States. Pretty cool. Then it disappeared. Months later, some birders down in Biddeford Pool, Maine, took pictures of a great black hawk. And they compared the photos and they said, this is the same bird that flew over the guy in Texas, went to who knows where, ended up in Maine. Um, it was seen for, I think, one day in Biddeford Pool and then again disappeared. And then it was seen on the Eastern Prom in Portland and then disappeared. And then it was seen in Deering Oaks Park where it spent months, two months, um, over 2018, 2019, in Deering Oaks Park, this incredibly rare bird in the winter of Maine. And it was, let me tell you, a sensation. Birders from all over the nation were flying to Maine to see this bird. Um, <clears throat> Maine Audubon, my colleague Doug Hitchcock was there every day, orienting people to this bird, talking to school kids who were walking through, just going to school, look at this incredible rarity. And it was a sensation, this great black hawk. Um, didn't end great. Um, this is a tropical bird not built for a Maine winter. You can see um, all the, the bare leg there coming out from below this black hawk. That, uh, birds that are built for the winter don't have a lot of bare parts. And so this bird, after a particularly cold snap in Maine, was found um, with frostbite and eventually euthanized. Sad story, inspired a lot of people, a wonderful bird. And guess what? It lives on. The city of Portland has erected a statue of the great black hawk in Deering Oaks. I think Maine is the only place I've ever heard of that has a statue dedicated to a vagrant bird. I'm incredibly proud that it happened, and this was a remarkable bird. But guess what? It was, it was actually, there's another bird. You may have heard of this. This was another worldwide story. This bird is, <clears throat> um, again, a vagrant um, raptor. Um, this bird here sort of is in the Venn diagram of all rare birds. So it's a, it's a vagrant, but it's also a rare bird in its own right. This is a, a stellar sea eagle. There are only about 4,000 of these birds left on earth. 
and they mostly live in uh, Siberia, Siberia and sort of uh, the Korean Peninsula. Um, a very rare bird. It's the largest eagle on earth. This is a dream bird for me and a lot of other birders. This is a bird that we never thought we'd see. This huge eagle with this huge yellow bill. Um, and we always dreamed about going to Siberia and seeing one, but I don't know, Siberia is not the highest on my list. And so I never thought I'd see one. But um, starting in 2020, um, one of these birds uh, was, was seen in Alaska, right? Not that crazy. These birds have shown up in coastal Alaska before, but this one bird was in interior Alaska. Pretty cool. Um, birders made note of it, but that's Alaska. Weird things happen. We moved on. A couple months later, um, someone in Texas, near coastal Texas, took a picture of a stellar sea eagle uh, on a perch in Texas. One person saw it, never seen again. Okay, we said, maybe that's an escaped bird. W weird, what is going on? Um, but then a couple months later, some birders up in Northern Canada, in Quebec, um, saw this again, took pictures of the bird and they could analyze, see how they, the white and the black, um, there's that transition of feathers. They could analyze that pattern on this bird and they could tell this is the exact same bird that was seen in Alaska. Couldn't quite tell if it was the same bird in Texas. People do think it is um, because of the posture of the wings of the photo was taken, but they said, this is the same bird. This bird is flying around the entire continent willy nilly. And that's cool. Flew around Alaska. I mean, flew around Quebec um, and then New Brunswick and then was seen in Nova Scotia. And we said, when's it coming to Maine? Um, and it did. Um, uh, eventually, after it was seen on December 20th in Massachusetts, it showed up a couple of days later, right before New Year's in Booth uh, near Five Islands in near, near uh, uh, Five Islands near Georgetown, Maine. And again, this was a sensation. This bird was there for uh, between Five Islands and Booth Bay Harbor area for about two months over the course of the winter. Thousands of birders came up and saw it. This was a huge story. Um, uh, I and my colleagues at Maine Audubon, I did interviews. I was on live TV in Brazil talking about this. I was on live TV in Nebraska talking about this bird all over the, the place. This was a sensation of a bird. Here's a little map tracking its uh, sightings. Um, uh, through this year. Um, and unlike the great black hawk, this bird has a happy ending. Well, there is no ending really. This picture was taken uh, less than a week ago in Newfoundland. This is the same bird. Um, it has been seen since it left Maine um, back in Nova Scotia and then in Newfoundland on the Avalon Peninsula and then now further north. Um, this bird is still alive and still going. And guess what? When the winter comes, it might come back to Maine. It might come back. Um, it, stranger things have happened and it, this is right on its typical wintering latitude. And so uh, fingers crossed that Maine's rarest bird might make another appearance. All right, I am over my time and I'm gonna stop there and to try to leave some time for questions. Nick, we could all listen to you all day. So thank you, that was incredible. I wanna, I, want to extend the Zoom for another hour. Just kidding. I'm not going to do that, but we're definitely going to invite you back for all questions. Anytime. Uh, but let's get into a couple of things in the, in the time we have left. First of all, I'm going to remind everybody, you don't have to just listen to the, uh, the Lunch and Learn. We're going to send you a link this afternoon so you can get your very own copy of Nick's guide and you'll be able to uh, hear his voice and his bird calls in your head. <laughs> yes, sorry about that. Uh, haunt, they'll haunt your dreams, maybe. <laughs> Questions about Stellar Sea Eagle topped the list, so thanks for getting into that and giving us a full update right away. A sure. couple other bird-specific questions from somebody in central Maine. Why don't we see robins? Hmm. In central Maine, don't see robins? Yeah. Um, you should. Robins okay. are one of the most, most widespread species in all of America. People, they are on the list of perhaps the most numerous birds in North America. And I've done some traveling this year. I was in Southern Texas and I've been around and I have seen robins every single place that I go. Robins uh, are down in the, uh, in the deserts, some places they're in a human habitation, they are in the, the South, they're in the forests of Katahdin Woods and Waters National Monument where I was recently. Um, they are uh, they are around. They are like many birds, 
sometimes harder to see in the summer, birds right now are doing their thing. They are have one mission and that is to raise their babies. And so a lot of birds right now are going back and forth to the nest. They're not calling as much. They're sort of like focused on the thing. And so sometimes in the middle of summer, it's actually harder to see birds even though they are around. Um, in the winter, our robins don't actually migrate. Some do, some move around, but um, robins have, um, they sort of collect together and they find fruit. Uh, and so a lot of like crab apple trees or winterberry or other uh, plants that produce berries and fruit in the winter, that's where you'll find the robins. Um, but um, so I don't know what to tell you, Central Maine. Um, um, uh, Jim here on the chat says that there are some in Lewiston. So um, listen for their calls, look for them in the, in the yards and uh, they're around. All right, well, I have to say, I have a fondness for robins because I always recognize them and I'm not always as confident about all of my other identifications. So they make it easy for you. Thank yeah, you. they do. I appreciate that. Yeah. Do you know, have there been any studies about the herring gulls that nest in town, say on hmm. urban rooftops? What's up with them? Well, it's a great place to nest, you know. Um, rooftops are uh, free of people for the most part. They are close to the food source that they're looking for and um, uh, a good place for birds to nest. It's actually, there are studies, I'm not, um, I can't quote them, but um, there are certain birds that have really sort of adapted to rooftops. I know some killdeers, which are these little shorebirds, um, nest on rooftops, especially when you see roofs with like gravel on them. Um, same thing for, for birds like common nighthawks. You know, um, birds will take what we give them, you know, and um, rooftops um, have turned out to be a fairly safe place for gulls to be. One interesting thing about gulls right now is they're actually among some of the quickest declining species of anybody in Maine. Um, that in, is due in large part because humans actually propped up their numbers for a long time. Um, humans, when we came up, we did a couple of things. We made a lot of landfills. So giant open garbage areas, which if you're so inclined is a delicious source of food and you don't mind everything that comes with it. Uh, and we also, along a lot of our wharves had a lot of you know fish pieces and food for them to eat. So once humans came along and made all these landfills and made all these wharves, the population of gulls shot way up, uh, much, much higher than what you see if you read like historical accounts. Now that we're sort of closing a lot of landfills, capping landfills, and changing some of our wharf practices, there's actually less food that we're giving um, gulls around. So gulls overall are sort of declining, not in a way necessarily that we are uh, concerned about in Maine, uh, more towards sort of a natural number. That's really interesting. And thanks for that context, because you know we hear a lot of alarming statistics about, about things that threaten birds. And, and so it's good to know that not all declines are bad. But speaking of threats, yeah, avian flu, yeah, Heads, headlines are scary. I don't know anything about it. What's what should I know? Well, avian flu is a communicable disease, communicable disease that uh, transfers from birds to birds, um, and there is a particularly virulent strain that is working its way through uh, a lot of birds this year. Um, we first heard about it in the spring when folks were concerned about birds working their way north. Um, at that point, the, the major threat was to sort of um, domestic uh, bird populations. So if a, a wild bird contaminated with, with avian flu, this strain were to come in contact with domestic waterfowl or chickens, um, it could be devastating to those groups. And so in the spring, we, we sort of watched that happen. Now what's happening is that sort of danger has largely passed, but what we're seeing now and what a lot of folks in the Northern Hemisphere are seeing around the globe are really sad and scary impacts to um, nesting colonies of birds. So a lot of seabirds nest in close together, they nest in colonies. Um, you know, birds like to live on these offshore islands where there are not a lot of predators and they can sort of find mates and things. But what that, and so I'm talking birds like gannets and gulls and, um, and murres and birds like that. Um, so what we're seeing, unfortunately, and, and the damage is, is still unfolding, are um, potentially major impacts to colonial nesting seabirds happening around the Northern Hemisphere right now. And that's, um, 
sad and scary and and we're sort of still watching it unfold and seeing what's going to happen they didn't get the memo about social distancing they didn't and they got nowhere else to go unfortunately <laughs> okay nick i know you've got a list this is a thing that birders do right oh yeah how oh, yeah. many birds have you seen um in maine i've seen 352 um i know that number exactly um my uh in maine the biggest number to get to is 400. My colleague Doug Hitchcock has just seen his 399th bird the other day, a Henslow Sparrow in Brunswick. He is knocking on the door of the 400 Nirvana. It's a, it, there's maybe one or two or three or four other people who've ever got there. Um, so I've seen 350. I was outside of Maine for like eight years. So whatever, what are you going to do? Um, 350 in the United States. Um, I have seen um, 700 on the dot. If you, if you don't count Hawaii, a lot of people, when they keep bird lists, they don't count Hawaii because it's got so many other different things, including Hawaii, I've seen 731. Um, uh, I know these off the top of my head. Around the world, I've seen something like 1,135, <laughs> I think. <laughs> there, are about, there are more than 10,000 species on, on earth. And so I got a long way to go and I cannot wait to get everywhere else to see them all. I love that. I love that you know that. I love that you're, you're making making an effort you're gonna you're gonna get there i oh, believe in you i encourage everyone out there if you're not on ebird to start an ebird account you can it's great to keep track of what you've seen what you've seen before or just keep track of what's in your backyard um, ebird is a great tool it's so easy to use uh and and it's really great and we are going to add that to the follow-up email this afternoon. Is there anything else we should put on that list, Nick? Good resources, yeah. especially for those of us who are yes. not, not where you are. This is going to, this, there, there is an app that came out this year that has changed the game. Um, it's called Merlin Sound ID. And what it does is if folks remember um, uh, something called, um, oh, what was it called? Uh, well, it, <laughs> You hold it up, you press play, and it listens to the birds singing around you and tells you what species they are. Um, it's really incredible um, because learning bird song, which I still encourage everyone to do, learn birds, but it's just hard. There, there's you know hundreds of different calls and songs and chip notes and and flight notes out there, and they all sound sort of the same. And so, um, if you, like me, you don't have a particularly incredible mind for sound, um, this app is not 100% perfect and you should take especially if it gives spits out some you know very rare bird but it's really really good and um it picks out things that i don't hear um it picks out things from a dense chorus of birds um so merlin sound id has really changed uh very quickly sort of how birding because it's it's so good at doing things that are very difficult that's great. I'm going to add that to the email too. So don't worry about it. You'll, it'll come your way this afternoon. Right. Uh, how can we keep up with your birding adventures? You ah. do a lot of interesting things. Yeah, good question. The best way is probably on Twitter at the birdist. Um, I also have a website, nicholaslund.com, where I keep my, uh, my freelance writings. Um, and I don't know, just call me, email me, whatever. <laughs> I'm around. You can count on that. And, yeah. uh, and tell us what's uh, what's the next book you're working on? Yeah, I have uh, two books in the pipeline, actually, two that are geared again towards middle grade audiences. Uh, one is about evolution, a very cool book um, taking basically a modern species and tracing it all the way back. Um, so you can see how the, the you know, the, the creature evolved to become modern species. Um, which is really interesting and I'm excited for that to finish. I don't know when that's coming out. Um, the other one is about um, extinctions, bird extinctions. So it's um, talking about different habitats and a story of uh, a bird that uh, has gone extinct from that habitat. And then a story about a bird that humans are working to save from that habitat um, called the world without birds. Um, and that, uh, again, I'm not sure when that's coming out, uh, but it's a really cool um, sort of history of um, what humans, for the most part, the vast you know, majority of extinctions have a cause because of humans, um, you know, how we are impacting the landscape and then how we're actually working to protect, um, to correct ourselves. I can't wait to read it. I can't wait to invite you back when those books come out and yeah. 
and lots of other times. <laughs> I'm so grateful to you for, for spending this hour with us today, Nick. It's never enough time, but uh, but we're going to do it again soon. Thanks to everybody for joining us Thank today. You. I hope you'll all join us back here next week. Uh, our program on July 15th is celebrating Katahdin Woods and Waters Monument. We are celebrating the sixth anniversary of that national monument and will be joined by Lucas St. Clair, who was one of the primary forces behind the national monument and is the president of Elliottsville Foundation. He's gonna tell us all about it and I have a feeling inspire us to make a make some travel plans and adventuring plans for this summer. Well, actually, let me jump in real quick. Maine Audubon, we just released yesterday a birding hotspot map for Katahdin Woods and Waters National Monument. So if you're interested in visiting and want to know where to go together. to see birds, go to maineaudubon.org right now and uh, check out the map. I'm going to add that to the email this there afternoon, you too. You guys are going to have a fabulous bunch of, of things to do this weekend. Thank you all, and we'll see you soon. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Nick. Bye.